thank you, Jeremy. And as always, uh, thanks for all your help uh, with all these uh, complex logistics around the technology. So welcome to the sixth in our series of webinars that we've entitled The Doctors Are In. Medical collegiality has been in decline for years. The COVID-19 pandemic and the medical lockdowns have put an even greater strain on our professional bonds. And in a sea of, of conflicting and sometimes false messaging at APS, we believe that we, we need each other more than ever as colleagues. We need to be talking to each other about the clinical problems that we face every day. We need to be sharing our clinical stories. We need to be sharing our interpretations of the scientific literature. The topics in this webinar series do relate to COVID, but really this crisis reveals a lot of issues around science and, and the systems around us as physicians. And we're really interested in using what's going on right now as a jumping off point to understand the bigger issues that have been going on all the time. So it's my honor to invite my friend and colleague, Dr. Kernan Mannion. Uh, Dr. Mannion is the founder of the Center for Physician Rights, which is the only physician-centric advocacy organization providing guidance and support to physicians whose careers are threatened by false allegations of workplace impairment. Dr. Mannion has practiced psychiatry over many years in a lot of diverse inpatient and outpatient settings, public and private, and now he's working uh, in the area of coaching and consulting. And a lot of his work uh, in that area uh, revolves around his expertise, his areas of special expertise in the fields of post-traumatic stress disorders, stress reactions, um, and, and burnout. So just an introduction to the topic tonight. Uh, the news media have informed us that we're going to have a wave of of reactions in physicians and other frontline medical workers, and they're gonna be facing psychological fallout from the trauma of caring for COVID patients with inadequate resources. And that's true, and we're gonna be anticipating, but what the news media aren't telling you is that many physicians are gonna be falsely labeled as having mental illness, um, when really they're having stress reactions that result from a failing workplace. Um, and so Dr. Mannion is here to uh, tell us about that topic in detail. Dr. Mannion. Great, thank you so much. Um, very much appreciate that generous welcome. I hope everyone can hear me and can see the slides pretty well. Perhaps you might wanna just indicate that in the comment box uh, so that uh, we know that we're coming across clear and so that Jeremy can pick up on that or Bob can pick up on that. Uh, as the presenter, uh, often it's very difficult to keep an eye on the comment box. So uh, please go ahead and just offer your comments or uh, even in the Q&A uh, box there to uh, let uh, Jeremy and Bob know. Uh, so if you would, just you know, take a moment there, get familiar with that box there and, uh, and just uh, comment. You can hear okay, volume's okay, uh, et cetera. And uh, Jeremy will let me know, uh, you know if we have any problematic uh, issues there. So yes, uh, I am a psychiatrist uh, by long uh, training and practice and had a di diversity of experiences in the world of mental health. And uh, I really found myself grappling with uh, what's going on now with regard to those, especially who are on the front line of the COVID pandemic. Uh, those who have been called to duty, those who have selflessly put themselves uh, in harm's way, uh, and those who uh, have perhaps been punished uh, for either not reporting to duty or those who um, have been punished for speaking out about the inadequate preparation uh, of uh, inadequate PPE, uh, etc. And so we are bombarded continuously about there's going to be a mental health crisis. You know, what's going to happen with all these people who are coming forward? And I do believe that we are going to see significant fallout from those who are dealing with the front lines. 
However, the concern that I have is about the what they're going through is going to be falsely alleged to be a mental illness. And that has some very severe consequences. And so the thrust of tonight's presentation is really taking a step back and looking at what do we mean when someone has some mental health issues? Now, I don't know how many in our audience this evening are in the world of mental health. I hope that there are a number of you uh, present because uh, I look forward to having your feedback on what I'm going to propose here. Uh, and um, uh, but, but many are unfamiliar with the world of the way mental health works and the way diagnoses are made and what that really means. I think it's fair to say that many people are fearful, many physicians are fearful about getting any sort of mental health support. And people have attributed that reluctance to, oh, there's a stigma around getting uh, mental health treatment, or there's a stigma around mental illness. And what I'm going to propose tonight is, I don't believe that those are really the determining factors of what's holding physicians back from getting help. And so what we're going to do tonight is take a look at the general concept of reactive syndromes that people go through. And then we're going to take a look at a particular diagnostic category that is used perhaps too frequently and those who present for help. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to pose the possibility that maybe our paradigm is really flawed, really fundamentally flawed, even at the initial diagnostic level. And we already know that the medical culture is deficient in creating a safe, wholesome environment for physicians to get the help that they need. So that's going to be our framework tonight. And then we're going to open it up for questions and answers and commentary uh, after about 40, 45 minutes of my presentation. All right, so let's go ahead and, uh, and dive in here. Let me get that uh, arrow out of the way. Um, so our objectives tonight are that, first of all, what I want us to go over is that there are an array of psychological distress syndromes and these distress syndromes, these reactive syndromes, are often confused with quote-unquote mental illness. Uh, I want to help us understand how to make that diagnostic distinction because it really is crucial and that if we don't make that distinction, then the misattribution has some very serious consequences. And then to look at the issue of whether or not the categories that we're speaking about are of a reaction syndrome nature or whether they are a mental illness, bona fide mental illness uh, situation, what are the pros and cons of a physician actually reaching out and getting some form of mental health help? That's the big picture for uh, our presentation tonight. Now, since I've been doing the stress work for quite a while, it always occurred to me when we talk about, boy, he really blew a fuse. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's a very apt metaphor, blew a fuse, in terms of dealing with the stress. So even pre-COVID, when we look at the stress that physicians have been going through, we know the incidence of burnout is really quite significant, and uh, physicians may lose it. You know, they may have a meltdown uh, with a fellow staff member, a subordinate, uh, an administrator, a patient, uh, or even driving home. They may have some sort of a reactive uh, event uh, on the roads. Many, as we know, in residency are pretty sleep deprived and uh, uh, they're more likely to be reactive. So this notion of a fuse uh, is a very curious one here. So when we look at what the impact is, what is it that blows that fuse, what do we realize? We realize that there was an overload in the circuitry and that is what actually blew the fuse. 
And so I, I often ask uh, people, uh, if the fuse blows, was the fuse defective? See, now, now we can consider this sort of like a, uh, a Confucian koan. And uh, well, no, in fact, it was meant to blow. It can only take so much before it breaks down. And the purpose of it breaking down is to say, hey, guess what? I can't take any more volume here of electricity. That's all there is to it. Now, when you think about hurricanes, okay, hurricane is a very powerful stress. And when I think about a hurricane, I think about, you know, the forces that are configuring, let's say, in the Gulf of Mexico. I grew up in New Orleans. I'm now in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, so we have a different kind of a storm system up here. But I grew up in New Orleans and very familiar with hurricanes and the power of hurricanes. And lots of people build along the coast and the vicinity of the coast. And so you look at this house on the left here, and it's pretty solidly built, very handsome house. And you look at that residue on the right, that very same house. This was, in fact, a before and after picture uh, of a house uh, after one of the major hurricanes. And I would ask again, was that house deficient? Was it substandard housing that caused it to collapse in this way? And of course, the answer is no. So what I'm posing here is that there are syndromes that occur that have such an immense stress impact that they are going to have a profound effect on the individual. So we have the stressor, which is the force, the hurricane. We have the stressee, which is the house. And we have the impact of the stress, which is that collapse. And the same principle applies to people who are going through stress responses. And what I propose tonight is that a number of the response syndromes that we are going to be seeing in relationship to COVID are reaction syndromes. They are in response to a very powerful stressor or series of stressors that result in a stress response syndrome. So we know from the stress literature that stress can have profound effects in, uh, throughout the body, throughout the mind. And the best way to summarize its effect is really very simplistically here. And for our purposes right now, let's say that stress has impact in the cognitive realm and in the emotional realm. And these two together are the mental realm. And it has an impact on the bodily realm, namely the organs of the body. And it has an effect on the way that we actually respond in the world, in our behavioral responses. So when we think about stress syndromes, we realize that there are basically four categories of manifestations of stress. And it turns out that many of us have a default mechanism of managing our stress, just as many of us have a default mechanism of displaying any particular emotion. So in having a, a stress uh, a manifestation, uh, some will manifest it predominantly cognitively in terms of inability to think, to remember, to concentrate, or maybe cognitively pulling away from the work. We see that in burnout with regard to one of the core symptoms of burnout. Some will have the emotional response that there will be a tremendous sense of anxiety or anger. Some will have a bodily response. They become very sleepy. Some have a behavioral response. They might get explosive. They might pound the table. They might curse. And we have a tendency to have a default pattern of responses to uh, stress. So let me pose to you a scenario that we're likely to see and it's already manifested itself in a number of prominent cases. And this is Jill. Jill is an emergency medicine physician. She's 31 years old. She's two years out of her residency program. And she loved emergency medicine. And she works uh, in an urban hospital. 
she's got a very, what seems to be a compatible department, and she feels very dedicated to the work. Earlier in her life, when she was in med school, she had a depressive episode uh, in relationship to her going through a divorce. She took some leave under Family Medical Leave Act. All was fine. She went back to work with no problem. So here she is in this emergency medicine department, and the patients love her. She's a very compassionate physician. She takes time with the patients, actually to the annoyance of the staff and to some of her colleagues, because they're saying she really takes too much time. You know, she just, she, she's too devoted to this. She really needs to be in something else. But, you know, emergency medicine, we've got to move these people through. And she does fall behind on her charts, but she stays over and she works on her charts and finishes them up. Now, what happens here is that um, recently, uh, in the context of COVID, um, an infant was brought in with the mother, and uh, it appears that the infant had some sort of a pneumonia, and it appears to have been COVID-related. But unfortunately, the testing was not available, and so they're having to wing it. But dealing with a child who is desperately uh, gasping for breath and trying to rescue that child in the context of an illness like COVID is very dramatic. So she lost that child. As the epidemic continued, uh, she saw the onslaught of more and more patients coming in. Some are excessively worried. Many were severely hypoxic and needed to be worked up quickly. She also recognized that the hospital, as so many, were not prepared in terms of ventilator support. They also had a significant backup in the emergency room, trying to get people adequately disposed of so that they could be appropriately treated. So needless to say, this resulted in a tremendous amount of commotion in the emergency room. Now this is, as I said, an urban emergency room, and so it's not immune to trauma, and it's not immune to violent trauma. And so she had been exposed also recently to some rather dramatic flare-ups prior to COVID, uh, when a gun-wielding uh, patient uh, had to be restrained and she felt her life had been threatened. Now also in the context of COVID, as she is busily treating patients, she learned that a colleague had contracted COVID and followed that colleague in his inpatient treatment, and he was in severe respiratory distress and ultimately died. She was profoundly affected by the loss of that colleague and was also affected by the death of that baby who she was not able to rescue. She had raised an issue earlier on with regard to the inadequacy of the preparation for this epidemic and the fact that she and her colleagues and the nursing staff didn't have appropriate PPE. And she was told that she just needed to mind her own business on that and get on with her work. She tried to raise the issue that she might be pregnant. She was hoping to get pregnant. And uh, she was told that that really need not be a concern right now. Her duty, her oath, was that she needed to report for duty and to basically uh, live up to her pledge. Jill then progressively started to become more withdrawn, overdue on her charts, dreading going in to work, finding herself breaking down in tears. And so I want to pose to the group, what is this? If you were a therapist or a psychiatrist who was seeing Jill, how would you go about thinking about this? How would you go about approaching this? If you were not a mental health clinician, if you were her primary care doc or perhaps her colleague, how might you go about thinking about what's going on for her and what might you be inclined to do? So as I said, here she is in the emergency room and she loses this lovely child to what appeared to be a COVID-related pneumonia. What are the syndromes then that we would expect to see, these reactive syndromes? Well, let's start with baseline stress. 
We already have, as we know from many, many, perhaps too many studies, that burnout is rampant in the medical profession. And it's said to be at the rate of 50% of physicians grappling with at least one sign of burnout using Maslach's criteria, exhaustion, detachment, and reduced sense of accomplishment. We also know that as being a physician, we're going to encounter death and dying. And for a significant number of us, encounters with death and dying can be really quite profound. And many of us can find ourselves moved by the immensity of that passing. It doesn't mean that every person who dies, we become grief stricken. But there are certain patients that we might have gotten attached to or who move us in some particular way and we go through a grief response. And likewise, she lost a colleague. We also have the situation that we might call traumatic stress, which invokes the acute stress response. Now, when we think about the literature of PTSD, we recognize that the acute stress response uh, is really one in which one is overwhelmed by a dangerous situation and or one is horrified or revulsed in a profound way and one feels one's life has been in danger and one then ends up going through a predictable cascade of stress with that. Even after the event passes, one will have recollections of the event disturbances of sleep, intrusive nightmares, intrusive thoughts during the day, brooding preoccupation. We'll also have a tendency to want to avoid anything that's going to remind one of the stress. And being an ER doc and having to go into the trauma situation, it's going to be pretty difficult to avoid that. And one of the other of the three core symptoms of PTSD is uh, that of hypervigilance, being on guard, always being on edge. And so the difference between the acute stress response and post-traumatic stress syndrome or post-traumatic stress disorder is that the original cascade of symptoms takes place within the first 30 days of proximity to the event. If the symptoms continue beyond that, then it's considered to be a post-traumatic stress syndrome. More recently, there has been the emergence of an entity that is referred to as moral injury. And we will talk more about moral injury further down in the presentation. But for now, let's describe it as a, 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 the experience of a sense of betrayal by a person in a position of authority, which has major consequences and which basically goes against our moral sensibility. Okay, so that is, that really is the essence of what moral injury is. And the term was originally propounded by uh, psychiatrist Jonathan Shea. And Jonathan Shea was working with the Vietnam veteran population in Boston and recognized that while a number of these guys who had seen combat were dealing with PTSD symptoms, he said that what he was discovering was something different than PTSD. And as he began to describe this sense of betrayal, he then saw that there was a cascade of other types of manifestations of emotions and thinking and behavior that were different than the PTSD cascade. And what happens in moral injury, he said, is that there is a fundamental alteration in character. There's a sense of, of cynicism. There's a sense of wanting to withdraw. There's an embitterment that one has been betrayed. One has been profoundly betrayed by a person or by a situation or by an institution. Another manifestation of moral injury is where a combat veteran has actually participated in an atrocity. Even should that person have been following the order, there is a sense after the event that that person betrayed their own moral principles. 
And so we have a, a complex moral injury here, where one is actually in argument with the institution which betrayed one's values and one's own participation in the violation of one's values. Now, we also expect to see in the context of COVID new or re-emergent bona fide underlying emotional illnesses. Now, I use the term emotional illness more than I'm inclined to use the term mental illness. And the reason I do that is because I find the term so vague, mental illness, that it can be so inclusive as to mean nothing. Everything is not physical, then becomes mental. And it seems ludicrous to me that, that we just sort of allocate uh, this term so loosely. So we have physicians who are grappling with a whole host of things. They're grappling with grief. The, the grief of their colleagues that, that they have lost or who have gotten sick, the grief of patients that, whom they've lost, um, and, uh, and other griefs, other losses that they've experienced that come to the fore. And what is the grief reaction? The grief reaction is one filled of sadness, predominantly. We have, we have those who have been so affected by a trauma that they develop what uh, we refer to in the stress uh, management arena as the thousand mile stare. It's sort of that blank, vacant stare that one is just looking out into space and trying to gather their thoughts and the thoughts just aren't getting gathered. It's a sort of a mental shock syndrome. What really happens here is that we find that people who go through these reactions are really in a state of shutdown. Their world is temporarily closed. They're really not able to process things in the way that they would normally have processed them. They are going through a profound stress response. Now, what happens? So what happens when we have a colleague like this and we say, oh boy, you know, uh, Jill, let's go back to Jill here for a moment. Jill's clearly having some problems. Jill uh, is really getting affected by the work. And what would normally happen? Well, uh, she might consider getting some counseling with a therapist. She may or may not have access to the employee assistance program at the hospital as an employee. She may say, I don't want to get help because it's a sign of failure. You know, I, we're not supposed to get ill. We're not supposed to get sick. We're not supposed to have symptoms. This stuff is supposed to roll off our back. So what's wrong with me? And what may happen is that her boss may say, look, uh, you better get help or um, we're going to have to take a look at whether you continue to work here. And so a number of things will happen, but generally what happens here is that a physician like Jill is said, you've got to go get mental health. Now, she either gets it on her own or she might get sent to the physician health program that is affiliated with the state medical licensing board. Now, uh, there are some issues having to do with physician health programs that uh, uh, I will not focus on tonight, but I have my own major reservations about the way these programs operate and um, whether or not they're really fair and square and whether or not they're really helpful to physicians in terms of physicians reaching out for help. Nevertheless, what will happen is that Jill will end up going to see a therapist. Now, what will happen here is that when one goes to get help through a therapist, the therapist is going to then make a diagnosis. And so the mental health therapist, whether it's a psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, nurse practitioner, um, uh, uh, professional counselor, LPC, uh, whatever happens, it is almost going to be invariable that the collection of symptoms that I mentioned, the manifestations of emotional responses that Jill is manifesting, are going to get clustered into a category 
uh, of mental illness. Now, therapists think that they're doing people a favor by saying, well, I'm going to give you the lowest level of diagnosis, which is an adjustment disorder. And an adjustment disorder is then subcategorized as an adjustment disorder with depressed mood, an adjustment disorder with anxious mood, an adjustment disorder with mixed emotional features, an adjustment disorder with disturbance of behavior. It's pretty generic, right? It's pretty broad spectrum. And you say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that once you have made a diagnosis, a person now has a diagnosis. And in the world of mental health, once a diagnosis is made, people feel a compulsion to treat. Now, I want to go back here and ask if, if you have experienced grief, and all of us have had some grief in our lives, if you have experienced grief and you went through a period of sadness, of tearfulness, of inability to concentrate, of, of not sleeping well, was that a manifestation of a mental illness? I don't think you would feel that it would be. Likewise, if you had been assaulted by someone and you went through a panic response, a fright response, and you continued to have thoughts of whether you were safe or not, would that constitute a mental illness? And again, I don't think it is. It's a reaction, and it's a normal reaction to extraordinary stress. And we'll see in a moment where the catch is here. So the focus here then goes on to attention, uh, on to uh, adjustment disorder. And I, I really want to spend a little bit of time looking at the problems here with uh, adjustment disorder, only to show that if we continue to go this pathway, we're liable to be doing more harm than good to the physicians who are seeking help. And rather, we need to be creating a culture that is one that's going to invite physicians into a safe space to deal with the stresses, the reactions that are inherent to the very difficult, very courageous work, the very loving work that we do. So adjustment disorder is sometimes referred to as situational depression, but note this, it's an abnormal and excessive reaction to an identifiable life stressor. Now, if you are profoundly affected by a major grief event, is that an abnormal and excessive reaction? I don't think so. If you are traumatized by a patient who threatened to kill you in their agitated psychotic state and is said to have a cough and may have COVID and coughed on you intentionally, and you have a profound reaction and a, and a fear for your safety and your family's safety, if you have a reaction to that, is that a mental illness? And I would say, no, it's not. That, that your reaction, even though it is excessive, is, is not an abnormal reaction. The stress itself was huge. And I think we have tended to underplay the stress that physicians face in their everyday lives. And we continue to parcel it away somewhere. No, I, I'm not affected by that. I'm not affected by something that went bad in the, in the OR. I'm not affected by, you know, patients screaming at me and crazy. The bottom line here is we are affected by it. There's no way to escape that. So in adjustment disorder, then, what I want to stress here is that the definitional criteria are that the reaction is more severe than would be normally expected. Now, what we're seeing here is that the reactions that we are seeing amongst physicians, they can be really quite intense. But does that mean that that is more intense than would be expected, given extraordinary circumstances? If a bomb went outside here, if I was in a war zone, or a bomb went off, and I heard people screaming, and I saw my buddy get blown up, you know what? My reaction might be one that's pretty wild, pretty crazed. Is that an excessive reaction to an extraordinary stressor? No. Now, they refer to it then as an extreme response. It's an extreme response. And again, here's the flaw in the reasoning, that it is not necessarily an extreme response given the fact that the stressor itself was pretty severe. 
They say stressors can be recurrent events. Indeed, they can. And, and they say it often brings on depressed mood, anxiety, or, or inappropriate conduct. Well, yes, but again, we're talking about the necessary criterion that it is an abnormal response to identified stressors. And that's the, that's the glitch here. And so what ends up happening is that a physician who, who presents for help is then given a diagnosis and then a quote unquote treatment plan. And unfortunately, too often, the belief is that, well, if you have certain symptoms, you must have an illness. So if you have sadness and you can't sleep at night and you're restless during the day and your appetite's off, oh, you must have depression. And so therefore then that sort of leads you down a pathway of getting treated for depression with an antidepressant, let's say when what you're really going through is a life experience that needs to be navigated, that needs to be worked through. So uh, uh, again, the criteria are very explicit that it has to be marked distress out of proportion to the severity or intensity of the stressor. And I think it's fair to say that the stresses that we have just named here are really pretty profound. So therefore, therefore, what happens here is that a person can then end up going into a therapist and the therapist, no matter how uh, benign they believe this is, is, is using a traditional paradigm of diagnosis. And that is that manifestation of emotion or behavior or cognitive findings equals a symptom. And we're all trained in a sort of this, this, this way of, oh, oh you know, a, an illness has symptoms and signs. And therefore, our task as diagnosticians is to pick up the signs and symptoms early. So we then go about picking up signs and symptoms. But you see the error here, this really fundamental error of reasoning, is that once I pick up a couple of symptoms that were from a normal grief reaction or a normal trauma reaction, uh, then I'm starting to collect symptoms of an illness. And I'm now saying, ooh, 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 that's an illness. And then I start channeling that person down a treatment pathway. And we'll see just a little bit later why that is so uh, dangerous here. So they say, so look, I mean, a whole bunch of things are factors that can influence how well a person reacts to stress. You know, their economic conditions, whether they have social supports or not. Uh, whether they have occupational and recreational opportunities. Well, the authors of this, I don't think really wrote this for the physician community because what we see in the physician community is, you know what? We don't have a lot of social support. Uh, we, have, uh, we have an eat your young mentality uh, in the medical culture. And so if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. And you're a loser if you are uh, upset about things that have gone down. So you just basically have to lick your wounds by yourself. And if you can't take it, well, you should have never gone into medicine anyway. You've heard this bullying, right? You, you're well familiar with this. And so what we find here is that the, the, you know, the reliable factors that might buffer someone against this quote unquote adjustment disorder are not present. Now, they say, well, the goals of therapy, quote unquote, the therapy, this is the treatment, the therapy, the goals of therapy will be around recognizing and taking advantage of the social support. So I'm going to make sure that you know that you have social supports available and I want you to rely on your family and your friends and your community. And the physician is going, do you have no idea what you're talking about? And well, we're going to help explore your coping skills. Do you have good enough coping skills? How are your problem solving skills? See, we're going to help you to solve problems better. Well, you say the physician is saying, how are you going to help me cope better with the loss of my colleague who died from a, a deadly illness that's going around this hospital? Well, we're going to use relaxation techniques. We're going to put you into meditation therapy or mindfulness therapy. Now, I'm being sarcastic here. I'm being facetious about this because, in fact, these are beneficial. The problem is that that by making the diagnosis, we then put someone into a deficiency position state and we pathologize the normal reaction. And what can only come from that is the person's own self-efficacy that says, you see, I am deficient. You see, I am weak. 
I am ill. Now, the consequences of that are profound. So, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, the recommended treatments for adjustment disorder, you know, help them, help them access the, uh, the resources that they have and teach them better ways to cope and help them put their stresses in perspective. Uh, all of this seems uh, uh, embarrassingly trite when we look at the immensity of what the traumas uh, of physicians today are going through, even pre-COVID, even pre-COVID with regard to the immensity and the anguish of the stress. And I can tell you from having consulted with hundreds of physicians who are going through extraordinary stress and a number of whom are grappling with the, the ill effects of having gone to a physician health program and being misdiagnosed, overly diagnosed, and funneled into a for-profit uh, impairment treatment uh, system, <clears throat> the anguish that they're going through is so immense that it's driven some to suicide. And so our task then becomes to try to step back from this and say, wait a minute, can we change the paradigm here? Because it may mean that we have to change the culture itself. We're going to have to understand as physicians that we have a culture that is not supportive of the suffering that our colleagues are going through, that we are going through. And I can tell you, when I went through my burnout, I went through burnout in the context of working uh, at a rehabilitation hospital, working with head injury, spinal cord injury, stroke, and chronic progressive neurologic illness. Imagine working with a population with a chronic progressive neurologic illness, okay? With, with relapsing and remitting multiple sclerosis that was progressively getting worse, uh, with Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, with, with progressive Alzheimer's disease. And, and, and these really took a toll on me. And we did not have the support resources available. There was really kind of like, you know, you either deal with it or not. And if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. And I found that to be really so um, stoic. Uh, no, it, it, it's sadistic. It's not really even stoic. It's like, you know, how that doesn't really make any sense. Because we know that even in combat, guys come back from combat and they've got severe PTSD and they get supportive services. It's like, yeah, guess what? You got PTSD. Okay, we're not going to hammer you over the head over it. You're not deficient for having it. So what is this treatment that they're referring to, this adjustment disorder, this treatment? Well, really what it turns out to be is it's, it's supportive therapy. This is what we do when we do supportive therapy. We basically create a safe space for somebody and we then help normalize the reaction we teach them about the reaction and we then help them think through, okay, let's do some practical thinking. Now, unfortunately, most therapists are not trained in coaching technique. So they have a tendency to still take the therapy approach, the conflict-based approach, the deficiency model, as opposed to offering a different model, a pragmatic problem-solving model, a safe space model, a model of hope that we're gonna move beyond this that you're not labeled, you're not pathological, you're not deficient, that this is a safe space. And unfortunately, because of the, the, the tact that medical licensing boards, physician health programs, sham peer review entities, malicious performance appraisal entities and residency programs where a chair wants to get rid of somebody and sideline them by making a false diagnosis, this is really quite hostile and it creates such a degree of unsettlement in the physician community that they say, I better not go get help. I mean, this is really pretty crazy. Why would I ever want to risk that? Besides, I'd feel like a loser. You know, I already feel like a loser for having my, my syndrome. And now I'm going to go get somebody, get labeled. And, and even, you know, in the treatment that's being offered right now, it really has a tendency to be a shaming treatment. Like, wh what is it that allowed you to put yourself in such a stressful situation to begin with? Right. I mean, I, I've seen this. I've seen this approach. Well, gee whiz, you know, you should have known how much stress you were getting into. And we're, we're, we're adding guilt upon guilt. And, and the implication is, why did you let this happen? You, either you have a bad sense of judgment or you just don't know how to deal with stress. And so we again come away with a shame response. Now, the consequences uh, of, of, uh, of, of going down here is that the, you know, the therapists are saying, well, if there's a manifestation, an emotional manifestation, a cognitive manifestation, that must be a symptom, and therefore symptoms must mean disorder, and therefore disorders must mean mental illness. And now you're down this track of mental illness. And the consequences of that are that, well, guess what? Number one, 
medical boards, 50% of medical boards around the country are still asking on their licensing and relicensing exams impermissible questions that are prohibited by the Americans with Disabilities Act. I've studied this act now for over a year in concert with an MDJD and with a JD whose specialty is the Americans with Disabilities Act. And these questions are in clear violation. And so what ends up happening here is that once you answer that question in the affirmative, guess what? You're sent to the physician health program. The physician health program conducts what they say is not a diagnostic evaluation, but it most certainly is, and then ends up telling you you have to do what they say or else. And if you don't go along with your program, which is a very costly process, then they report you to the medical board as non-compliant. And then your career is really screwed. And it's going to take you a hundred to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to extract yourself from this nightmare. That going on while you're grappling with your grief reaction, your burnout, your 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 post-traumatic stress disorder. See, and so it becomes a Kafkaesque nightmare. Now, also one of the downsides here uh, is that is that what ends up happening is that your insurance gets affected. Now, many people don't know this but that once you have a mental illness diagnosis, the adjuster says, ooh, mental illness diagnosis. They don't really understand the prioritization of mental illnesses, and this was the lowest diagnosis. All they read was adjustment disorder with depressed mood. And they're thinking, depressed mood, high risk for suicide. We're gonna put an extra rider on that insurance policy. Oh my gosh, oh, that person's liable to lose work because of their mental illness, and so therefore, they're gonna be a high risk for a disability policy. So you see the consequences here are really quite profound. And once you then get pulled into the PHP system uh, and you still can't get yourself out of it, you try to go to a different state, you have to report that. And so the nightmare never seems to end. And, and they're saying, wait a minute, people, there's gotta be something different here. There's got to be something different. So what's the most appropriate remedy? Well, humanity. Okay, a humane approach to our colleagues. Let's understand, first of all, that these stress reaction syndromes are not the same thing as an endogenous mental illness. There are, in fact, real mental illnesses that have to do with some sort of a biochemical irregularity that causes one to be more prone toward major depressive disorder. And major depressive disorder can be deadly. There's no doubt about it. And likewise, people can have bipolar disorder. They can have panic disorder. But these are biological processes and we don't really understand the diathesis and how much is related to external events and how much is related to the internal biology and the genetics. But, but they are real, but reaction syndromes have to do with an external stressor. And we don't have to, or we don't have to pathologize it and say, oh, you have X, Y, Z symptoms and therefore you need to go to the shrink. You need to go to the wizard as what they refer to uh, it when uh, people are in the military. So the first task is to recognize that these are normal reaction syndromes. Now, the crazy thing here is, is that when somebody goes to a therapist, the therapist has to make a diagnosis to get paid. So if you're going in and you're saying, hey, you know, I got all these symptoms going on, you're, you're, you're you know, you're really uh, allowing yourself to break down, talk authentically and, and, and have symptoms. And guess what? Um, person says, well, I think I'm, I'm going to give you the diagnosis. Uh, and even though you don't really meet the criteria or even if you do, it'll be the lowest level diagnosis. And that's the only way that the insurance company is going to pay me. Because if I don't submit a diagnostic code, they're not going to pay me. And you'll have to pay out of your pocket. Now, there's sort of an implicit fraud that goes on here. But, but that's the way many therapists have come to adjust to the realities of third-party payer. The next part of the appropriate response is a knowledgeable and caring support person. So that this person really understands the syndromes as they occur. And note, I'm not calling them mental illnesses or emotional illnesses. I'm calling them a syndrome. A syndrome is simply a collection of manifestations. And so, so a knowledgeable person who really understands this cascade, who is very caring, who is authentically caring, and who has a handle on how do you deal with stress syndromes? What's the process of helping somebody grieve? 
What's the process of helping somebody talk about their trauma? What's the process of helping someone talk about their moral assault, their moral affront, their moral injury? And then lastly, time heals. That, that the supporting, knowledgeable person can say, you know, we are going to get beyond this. Grief does not last forever. You know, the, the, the experience of trauma does not remain fresh in one's uh, uh, presence forever. And so we have to create the space and the time for that healing to take place. And if we created the medical culture that would enable that to happen, then I suspect that we would, we would see so much more pursuit of support resources that physicians need, and they could do so safely without fearing that their careers are going to be harmed or that they're going to lose all self-esteem or identify themselves as now I have a mental illness. So that's the big take here. That's the big concern that I am expressing here with regard to overdiagnosis. I'm recommending that we really go about a whole new framing of this so that we can understand how to be more available to our fellow colleagues and also directly to our colleagues to help them understand that this is not an illness. Okay? And it's perfectly fine. You're entitled to have this reaction and you're entitled to get the support that you need to work it through so that you can continue to bring to work the, the, the beauty of your calling and, and to do the work that you were called to do as a physician. So with that, I'm going to uh, pause and, uh, and uh, Dr. Emmons, if you might like to offer any comments, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Mannion. Uh, great presentation. And I am going to give a very brief response uh, before we pivot. And uh, Jeremy will very kindly uh, direct the question and answer as he's done so capably uh, throughout this webinar series. So these are some of my responses to Dr. Mannion's presentation. I, I think in AAPS, uh, we know the perils of false diagnosis of mental illness. We know that we know the perils of, of false or misguided allegations of workplace impairment. Uh, we know that for physicians to get psychiatric treatment, there's an element of peril in that if the information isn't handled confidentially. But what I appreciated uh, about Dr. Mannion's presentation tonight is he focused in on adjustment disorder. Uh, that's a diagnosis I think that we, we treat as rather innocuous. As he said, uh, well, if, the, if the, the psychiatrist or mental health clinician uh, wants to make some kind of diagnosis we sometimes think we're doing the patient a favor by making this uh, so-called low-level diagnosis. But in fact, Dr. Mannion reminds us, we should look at the diagnostic criteria carefully. The diagnostic criteria for adjustment disorder is not just a reaction to a life stressor. That's how we tend to think of it. It's a reaction out of proportion. And those are the key words. And this is where the pathology in the system gets falsely attributed to the individual physician. Yes. What's going on in the system is out of proportion. The out of proportion thing is not in the mind of the physician. And Dr. Mannion also reminds us that this push toward a sort of casual diagnosis, a sort of routine diagnosis comes from third party payment. And so it's a good reminder that this third party payment system that we all buy into, even AAPS members, we buy into it to some extent. These are the perils. So if you want to get out from under that, one very pragmatic step you can take is to not submit claims for insurance. 
And this is the reason that I always say to my patients, I'm not linked in to any electronic databases. Um, and that's how I say it. I'm not linked into the database. If you, my patient, want me to communicate with a colleague, if you want me to convey information and you direct me to, uh, I get a chance to discuss it with you and get informed consent for that release, but it's not going to happen automatically. And even this diagnosis of adjustment disorder is somewhat automatic. So I don't think we, we know in APS not to do things automatically, but even for us, it's a fine reminder not to do things automatically. So with that, I'll say thank you again to Dr. Mannion and I'll turn it over to Jeremy uh, to uh, do some uh, traffic control here with the question and answer. Great, thank you, Bob. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Emmons and Dr. Mannion. You know, as you mentioned, we'll now go ahead and start with Q&A. And again, you can submit a written question by clicking the Q&A button or if you'd prefer to uh, ask your question verbally, go ahead and raise your hand, click the raise your hand button. If you're on the phone, if you dialed in, you can, you can click star nine to raise your hand if you're dialed in star nine. And it looks like we have a good number of questions here already. And I'll go to the Q&A box here to start. Uh, First, this, this one doctor just says, this is an outstanding presentation, which has cleared up many things for me. I am so grateful this guy rocks. So uh, it's, I, and I concur with that. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, all right, here's a question. Uh, I'm a site where this is a question comment. I'm a psychiatrist. It sounds like you are suggesting we use the V codes as the diagnosis or diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Then we would bump up against not getting paid by third parties, but it would not be fraudulent. Mm -hmm. well, Any reaction to that? Yeah, indeed. Um, so uh, for those in the uh, audience who are not familiar with the diagnostic classification and the codes that are submitted, um, um, there are codes uh, called V codes. And these are codes uh, that are problems of life, if you will. And so what happens with these is that um, you're simply making, you had to give some sort of a cause uh, for the clinical encounter. And so you're saying this is the center of the focus. Uh, but it's not considered to be a mental illness per se. So for example, marital uh, uh, strain, uh, parent-child problem, um, work-related stress. These uh, are actually uh, in varying terminologies used as V-codes. And, uh, and uh, so uh, what this physician, the psychiatrist is asking is, should we submit the V-codes? Now, you know, here's the issue, uh, is that um, a physician who is coming to see you for treatment, uh, a support, okay, for support services. Let me step back here a little bit just from that uh, a moment here. And people make the false assumption, it's understandable, but they make the false assumption that mental health people because they treat mental illness, uh, if you go to a mental health person, that must mean that you have a mental illness. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, the making of the diagnosis sort of like confirms that, right? Um, and yet, the idea of counseling, the idea of learning how to do, let's say, for example, grief counseling or trauma counseling, uh, or uh, helping someone deal to, to articulate the uh, moral injury that they've experienced or to just simply tease things apart. That is a dialogue and when you have learned a variety of skills, which many people do learn in mental health uh, training, um, it's a very helpful modality. But but in order to use that modality and to, to use the services of that clinician, you're going to have to pay for it. Now we've gotten into a mindset that well, everything needs to be paid for by insurance. And frankly, I think that's dangerous territory. And I feel that this is going to really sound wild coming from a, a you know, physician. I really think that the, the insurance companies are right on target with that and saying, no, we have to set a limit somewhere. 
all problems of everything who comes into your, everybody who comes into your office with a problem of life is not necessarily having a mental illness that was meant to be covered under health insurance. You see, and so, however, the mental health community has unfortunately uh, sort of bent the rules there, feeling entitled or feeling like they're doing the patient a benefit, when in reality what has to happen here is that we have to discuss with that person, look, you don't have a mental illness, but I'm more than happy to work with you around this issue. Now, physicians, especially those in training, don't have a lot of money to go around. And so, therefore, we may need to do some fee negotiation with them. And I would even suggest that just as has been done with uh, veterans uh, who could not afford services, a, a, a community built up called Given Hour and therapists committed to taking on pro bono um, uh, veterans. And I think maybe the, the mental health community ought to do the same thing as long as we stay out of that diagnostic uh, designation. So I hope that answers uh, your question on that. Uh, thank you for that answer. And let's see, we had a raised hand here and now I'm not seeing it. Let me just take a quick look. Yep, so all right, the caller who had, uh, mm -hmm. the caller who had his hand raised lowered it. Uh, so again, if you'd like to verbally ask a question, click raise your hand and we'll get to you. We'll go to a, um, another question here that was typed in. And uh, this physician writes, Diagnosis, correct or not, can follow a physician for life and ruin his entire life. Is there any help for that? Uh, I think yeah. Dr. Mannion, you hinted that, or you said that a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars might extract a doctor from that, uh, and maybe you mentioned humanity also uh, mm -hmm. being more humane. But any well, it, further believe reaction it not, to that? Two hundred thousand won't extract them from that. Um, uh, that's how dangerous this is. And uh, so it's an excellent question. And that's why I think we have to lay out some parameters in terms of what is safe treatment. Uh, and so when we see someone, we're going to have to establish some very clear parameters around uh, confidentiality, around understandings of what is being reported. Uh, and uh, I'm working with some colleagues uh, presently around developing uh, an ethical statement of principles uh, for those who do forensic psychiatric evaluations. Uh, now, this notion of a diagnosis following one for life, uh, your concern about that is absolutely 100% on target. Here's the thing that I and my colleagues have discovered in intensive study uh, over this. Um, that um, when, first of all, um, a, a mental uh, illness diagnosis, or for that matter, a physical illness diagnosis is protected under multiple confidentiality laws. It turns out that uh, governmental entities like medical boards and their affiliate uh, agency, the Physician Health Program, which may or may not be uh, a governmental entity under certain categorizations, uh, they are required to follow these laws. And my and others' research suggests very strongly they are blatantly ignoring these. So therefore, if one really wanted to make a confrontation about this, one can say, wait a minute, there are various federal laws that spell out what's called PHI, protected health information. HIPAA is one of those laws, but there are multiple federal laws and there are also multiple state laws that should protect from the release of any sort of, uh, of uh, mental illness or substance abuse diagnosis. Those who are grappling with substance abuse, by the way, are also, when they're in a, a treatment program, they are also covered under a different law called 42 CFR Part 2, which governs the uh, administration of any federally supported um, uh, uh, alcohol and drug rehabilitation program. And the confidentiality stipulations in that are even stricter than those in HIPAA stricter. However, these are being abused with reckless abandon. So I think that one of the issues is so important that this be raised, because if we want physicians to be able to get treatment uh, with a bona fide emotional illness, with a bona fide quote unquote mental illness or a substance abuse issue, we're going to have to make sure that we protect the integrity of that diagnosis so that they are not harmed and they're not treated like uh, inferior citizens. 
And I am, I got to tell you, I am really enthused about the uh, direction that our research is going with regard to uh, the ADA. Uh, and I think that I would say that within a year uh, or two most, uh, I think that um, I think there's going to be some significant change in the way that boards and physician health programs and even peer review entities on hospital staffs uh, go about this reckless uh, treatment of evaluation of physicians and fitness for duty uh, evaluations. So I hope that addresses the concern and your concern is right on target. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mannion, and thank you for your advocacy and digging into those various rules and regulations. Sure. I believe one of the stimulus bills that passed recently through Congress made some changes to 42 CFR Part 2 and may have weakened them slightly. Yes, it did. Actually, they're trying to push that through, and it's a very covert means of weakening the protections under 42 CFR Part 2. And I think it's, it's exactly why advocacy organizations like AAPS uh, need to be aggressive in following this and mobilize members and say, look, people, here is what is happening underneath your nose, and you need to do something about it. And uh, because we can't allow those protections to be weakened in the same way that the protections uh, pr uh, protecting against sham peer review, which Dr. Huntoon is such an extraordinary expert at. Uh, uh, that what has happened here is that the protections were eroded behind the scenes and basically the enforcement of protections for physicians due process rights was basically the teeth were taken out of it and now physicians are subjected uh, to grotesque abuses uh, of rigged uh, peer review panels so you're exactly right about that Jeremy and and uh, yeah we've 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 got a you know, we've really got to be aggressive in taking our rights back to create a safe environment for physicians. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, a question just came in that's related to what you just said there regarding Shampier Review. Can you discuss the so-called disruptive physician label? Uh, any comments on that label that's used against? Yes. <laughs> Physicians. I, can, I can say that that is a label that is grossly misused and uh, that now look bottom line here is there are some pain in the butt uh, physicians. Okay, so just as just as there are people who do have bona fide substance abuse issues, there are people who have uh, bona fide emotional illness abuses with impairment. Uh, th there's no doubt about this. And, and there are some physicians who really are quite a terror. Okay, th that is real. Uh, and so the way that has been handled uh, was originally it was brought to the attention of, um, of hospitals who said, you know what, we have to start exercising control over this because it's disrupting our staff. Okay, and that was a real concern. Um, nurses were terrified to work with these physicians, other colleagues were terrified, and these often were high earners uh, who could, you know, wield a lot of authority in the, uh, on the staff. Now, however, what ended up happening is then, uh, is then hospital uh, uh, committees uh, and, uh, and their bylaws started structuring the peer review definitions in a rather uh, footloose and fancy free way. And then when you combine that um, uh, with uh, sham processes to do that evaluation, then you really have an unfair uh, uh, designation of a condition. So I think it's really important uh, to step back and say, okay, uh, if we're going to go down this route of disruptive physician, I really want to understand what does the literature say, uh, the valid literature say, not the biased literature that's written by the people who want to uh, lock physicians up in asylums for three months at a cost of $100,000. Uh, but what does the real valid concept say about disruptive physician behavior? And then what is the appropriate approach to disruptive physician behavior? It is not to destroy a physician's career. Uh, if, the, if the person has bona fide disruptive physician behavior, bona fide, okay, again, I want to underscore this bona fide, then you establish what are the key observations uh, that uh, define that disruptive behavior and you get buy-in from that physician. Do you agree with these observations here? And then you get an independent panel of people who are then going to ob observe how you perform with a, a designed, a well-designed uh, improvement plan. And that would be an improvement plan that would be applicable to anybody, even outside of medicine. If you're working for a high league, big league corporation and they're going, you know, you're acting like a jerk and you're gonna lose business for us. 
uh, if, if you want to stay with that business, they're going to say, we're going to put you on a performance improvement plan. That's all there's to it. And you either want to go along with the performance improvement plan or you don't. Uh, but, but what I'm saying here is, is we have to get back to the basics. The basics of what is the validity of that, of that finding, what are the parameters that establish that, and then study the hospital policy that defines disruptive physician behavior and, and study like a, like a wild man uh, everything that you can about how hospital policy is executed and how you go about contesting hospital policy so that you have a fair hearing. Because you've got to get somebody on board who really understands this process and is going to be willing to protect your rights up the wazoo. And unfortunately, too many, too many lawyers have taken the easy road and have said, give me $20,000 of the retainer and they write a few letters and get back with you six months later and say, you have to do what the board says, okay? Or you have to do what the hospital staff says, and you're screwed. And so, so you really want to make sure that you are scouting around for an attorney who understands this process uh, and, uh, and who can really jump on it. So, yeah. Thank you. And Let's see here. And we another comment here in the Q and A box. Um, workers' compensation allows for the release of all data to the state agencies involved, to carriers, and to the employer. There is no confidentiality. Confidentiality. Data mining of all social media is carried out by case managers. Video surveillance can be constant. In most states, the injured employee has no right to see his or her record from any doctor. Uh, that's something I was not, had not heard before, but that is uh, disturbing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for mm -hmm. typing that in. Any feedback on that, Dr. Mannion? Is that something? Well, uh, um, uh, uh, what I know about the workers' comp system, uh, one of my colleagues in Colorado uh, actually got into trouble with the board there because he took on the workers' comp system in terms of their abuses. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing a whole bunch of abuses. Uh, let's take the IME system for a moment. Uh, so, you know, the independent medical exam system uh, can be a corrupted system. And so people can hire the IME that's going to give them the result that they want. Just like boards can hire the expert witnesses that they want, uh, uh, even though uh, they're in the minority. Um, so we have to be very aware of these dynamics of how the system is being set up. Now, um, independent of, uh, of, of uh, 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 how workers' comp envisions itself to be, there are protections available at the state and the federal level that have to do with confidentiality of medical records. And very important that you review both the federal and the state regulations. So therefore, you would want to go to the literature and look up what the workers' comp laws say in that state. And you also want to then look whether or not there are any federal statutes that pertain to workers' comp, workers' injuries, et cetera. So here's, a, here's kind of like a case in point. Um, this is not directly workers' comp related, but in the, uh, in the airline industry, pilots are subjected to uh, a HIMS program, uh, H-I-M-S, which stands for Human Improvement Measures Study. And, uh, and it turns out that they're being subjected to the same false positive drug testing uh, for substances um, that is explicitly prohibited um, by uh, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, in 2006-2012, they issued two advisories on uh, cautions about using uh, such a test that was known to have false positives and really no normative data. Uh, and they were using that in a forensic setting and they said, no, this is a no-no, you can't do that. You can't jeopardize somebody's uh, career like that. Well, likewise, with regard to uh, privacy and confidentiality, I think we as physicians owe it to our patient to take the fight on, to say this is BS. We're not gonna be releasing these records willy-nilly, okay? And, and that we have to honor the patient's confidentiality. And, uh, and we have to advise the patient, here's what I'm being asked to do, and here's what they're telling me by law I have to do. And I think I would then call upon your state medical society, if you're a member, call upon AAPS, call upon every authority you can to say, tell me, I need to get more clarity around what are the requirements here and how can I be assured of my patient's records uh, confidentiality and put them on the spot and document their responses. 
because we need to be advocates for our patients' confidentiality. I've seen on the psychiatric side, I've had many subpoenas for records. And, uh, and you know, psychiatrists keep detailed records, okay? It's not just, oh, I started you on an antidepressant. We're seeing how, you know, somebody telling you about their marital history, about uh, whatever happened, if there's infidelity, they're telling you about, you know, all kinds of stuff. Now, we keep records on that primarily for our own purposes because we kind of want to follow the, the storyline, you know? If you got 40 storylines going on per week, it's kind of hard to keep up everybody's storyline. So these are little reminders to ourselves. But we've learned we got to keep two sets of records, okay? Now, that's not really well known. We got to keep two sets of records. And, and we say, okay, one is really kind of like our own record, and one has to do with, I saw this, I treated this, they're doing fine on this antidepressant, uh, and we talked about uh, crucial life issues. Okay, bing, done, that's it. So we have to get this serious. Now, when, when I've gone to situations where I've told the lawyer, I'm not, going to I'm not going to honor your subpoena. I refuse the subpoena, see? And then I've said to them, uh, you're going to have to take the next step. I want you to justify to me why you feel that this record is, is uh, appropriate to be released to you. I want to understand that. I actually got close to writing the lawyer and saying, you know, I have a patient uh, who was uh, in your practice. I want to see your records. How's that? <laughs> and uh, they're going through a divorce and having a hard time with it. And I want to really see what the issues are. Would you mind sending me your record? You know, kind of a response you get to that, huh? So I think that we need to get we need to get a little bit feisty here. Okay, we need to start taking this on and saying this is unacceptable people. We're going to put up a fight about it. Now I realize doctors are so beaten down by all this stuff. You know, we've got so much stuff going on. But I really want us to coalesce around the issues that matter. And we, if anything, are about the doctor patient relationship, preserving that, taking good care of patients to the best of our ability. Okay? That's what we're about. And so I want to see us get impassioned about that. So on that issue of confidentiality and workers' comp, go to town on it, study it, and, and detail it. And I'd love to hear what you learn, frankly. So if you'd like to, uh, to correspond with me, you know, certainly Jeremy will pass on the information. Great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for your advocacy there, Dr. Mannion, and standing up for your patients' rights. Yeah, we do hear from, uh, you know, not too infrequently from doctors who call to tell us that they, they do similar things when they're you know, pay, records are demanded and they feel it's inappropriate, they, they push back and say, say no. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, they're not forced to turn them over. Jeremy, I see that there is a hand raised. So yep, we got, yeah, let's go, let's go to Dr. Fisher here. Yeah, and we have uh, some other, we have yeah, some Dr. other Dr. Fisher. That we get to. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. Go, go ahead, Dr. Fisher. Yes, this is Al Fisher from Oshkosh and just before this uh, webinar started, I was watching Newsy TV, where a mental uh, health uh, specialist was speaking about the stress reactions of COVID-19 uh, doctors that they might uh, benefit from being treated with ketamine, that it uh, resets the flight or fight flight reaction. And this did not sound like a very good idea uh, when I heard it. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. Mm, mm. Yeah, well, I'll be happy to comment. It, it's amazing how everybody, uh, you know, mental health people have a tendency to want to respond with a drug. Uh, and everything is uh, an illness and everything can be quote unquote mediated uh, through uh, adjusting the neurotransmitters. So, you know, you've got uh, an awful marriage and, uh, and you're going broke and your boss is about ready to fire you and you've got depressed symptoms, well, uh, how about ECT? You know, how about if we put you in the magnetic uh, uh, resonance machine or whatever? I mean, it's kind of like people, how about if we help somebody do some problem solving here? Uh, and so this automatic resorting to a chemical remedy is, uh, is I think, deeply flawed. So rather, the stress response syndromes need to be dealt with, as we said earlier, humanely. Uh, compassionately, knowledgeably, giving somebody space, time, creating a supportive network for someone to work this thing through, because there's some powerful things that are going on. And when we can speak our truth to the reality of the power of this, then we're saying, look, people, this is the immensity of the stress we're on. This is why 50% of physicians are getting burned out. This is the immensity of the stress. Let's stop trying to contain it. Let's stop trying to keep accommodating to it. 
and 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 you know taking on medication so I can deal more with the stress. No, we need to confront the situation and say, people, this is insane. Uh, I'm sorry. So that my, my response is uh, I'm I'm very leery of that. By the way, on that issue, uh, one of the issues in dealing with uh, uh, combat soldiers uh, uh, that came up was could we somehow block their fear response? Uh, so therefore, could we give them a beta blocker so that they wouldn't go through post-traumatic stress disorder? Now imagine that, that, that was a real consideration. Prophylactic treatment of the fear response. This is very, very dangerous. That, that you're basically numbing someone's sensibility out so that they don't have an impact on their own psyche. Uh, so <clears throat> anyway, I think it's comfortable, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Fisher. Now, uh, in the chat room, there's a related, somewhat related comment uh, from a participant. I ended up on a high dose antidepressant for off-label indication. I ended up manic. Now I carry this diagnosis. I haven't seen any, re any review of my scenario, although I see there are congressional hearings on the subject of overuse of antidepressants. So that's a frightening story. Well, Thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, it's very, uh, very concerning. And so uh, what we have here is we're talking about basically a iatrogenic uh, uh, bipolar uh, disorder, right? So somebody basically started on, ant on an antidepressant. And uh, in fact, if the psychiatrist didn't do an adequate evaluation of the possibility of a bipolar disorder and administered a medication that activated that, you know, we're really talking about uh, some degree of malpractice, but that's not the issue here. The issue here is, and look at this, uh, I, I uh, started a treatment uh, pretty innocuously and ended up then getting sick as a result of the treatment. And now I've got this quote, this label of, of, of uh, a manic uh, uh, disorder. Uh, and it's really quite problematic. And I think that that's why we need to be very aggressive when this sort of stuff happens that we need to get appropriate guidance um, through physicians in the know and through, uh, through lawyers in the know to say, stop this. No, this person does not have a primary mental illness. And I would even go as far as to say, now this is a bit daring here. I'd even say that we are overdiagnosing depression. See, depression uh, is uh, the common cold of mental health, okay? 20% um, of people are gonna have a major depressive episode. Uh, in the course of your lifetimes. So let's, let's stop treating it as though it's this, ooh, you know, oh my God. Now there are some episodes, there are some manifestations of major depressive disorder that really do need to be treated intensively and they are associated with suicidal ideation, et cetera. But not everybody who's depressed has that degree of severity. So, so I think there's this overreaction uh, and, and I think, you know, for the person who's grappling with that, I would encourage you to then be thinking about how do I extract myself from this crazy system because this is making me sick. Yeah. Thank you for that answer and comment there. Sure. And so here's a challenging question. Uh, this participant writes, thank you, Dr. Mannion. I'm so glad you are bringing this serious problem out in the open. How can we make others aware of this problem? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's a challenging, a challenge there for well, sure. Indeed. Thank you, Dr. Mack. I appreciate your uh, comment there. Uh, and indeed, we really do need to do it in forums just like this. And, uh, and every other forum we need to bring, we need to become educated about these issues. We need to bring it to our medical societies and we need to demand that it get put on the table. Uh, those who are involved in larger organizations, AAPS, AMA, uh, APA. Um, APA is not going to be very receptive to this, I can tell you right now, uh, that they're pretty resistant. They want to call everything, any, any emotional symptom that you have outside of a bland contentment uh, is a mental illness, <laughs> right? So we need to be very cautious about that, but we still need to put it forward. We need to say, look, people, we're going to, we're going to, I'm sorry, we got to get back to basics here and create an environment that is real uh, and, and recognize that we're in a high stress uh, 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 profession. Let's support each other and, and share the goals of compassionate quality care uh, for people. Yeah. Thank you. You, you see me coming onto the screen. Uh, because um, it, I'm uh, the timekeeper and it's time for our fun to end. 
so I will say uh, thank you, Dr. Mannion, very much uh, for uh, a great presentation uh, with uh, great metaphors and uh, great visuals and great clinical stories. Um, thank you for keeping us firmly, keeping our feet firmly in the clinical ground while we deal with these issues that are sometimes abstract. Um, and uh, thank you all participants for joining us tonight. We're going to keep this going every other week. Um, we will be uh, in touch with you generally about a week in advance with the topic and we're going to continue to explore the the issues that affect us every day and that have been affecting us every day in our clinical practices that are that are really brought to the sur surface by the the crisis around the lockdowns and the, and the COVID virus. Uh, and Jeremy, thanks again, uh, as always, uh, for your great work uh, with the logistics. And and let me thank you both uh, for inviting me. It's really been a delight. It's been an honor uh, for me. Uh, I do note that there were some questions that we didn't get to, and I'm just wondering if there's a way that off offline I can answer those or comment on those and send them to you, Jeremy? Yes, uh, absolutely. And I was just going to mention that here. In about 30 minutes, everyone will be getting a post-event email. And in that, there'll be a link to fill out the evaluation for this evening's webinar that we need you to fill out in order to get your CME credit. So please do that. But also, if you have a question that we didn't get to, or if you think of one later, please just respond to that email and we'll get that, uh, work on getting an answer for you. We'll get that to Dr. Mannion and then I yep. uh, will address every getting an answer. I assure you of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so with that, I really just want to thank both of you, Dr. Emmons, and thank you, Dr. Mannion. Uh, and thanks to all of our participants for all everybody's doing in these during these challenging times to fight for patients in the profession. Um, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and sign off for tonight uh, from, from me and from AAPS. Uh, have a good evening and a good rest of your week. Goodbye. Good night, everyone. Stay well.